I think that the overturning of Roe versus Wade was disastrous in a material sense for American women, and we're going to fight hard to make sure our rights are restored. I'm really excited to see this uh, step forward uh, in protecting women. Um, it's not done yet. There's a lot more to do to, to support every woman and child. Uh, but this is a great marker of saying that actually as a society, uh, we can do um, a lot better. Well, hello and welcome to today's edition of Unbelievable. A uh, really important topic, uh, a recent topical issue that's hit our headlines recently. And I'll introduce my guests in a moment's time. But if you're watching here on YouTube, do make sure to like today's video and subscribe to the channel for more great discussions and debates. You can even get yourself a free ebook when you subscribe to our newsletter. The links are all with today's show. Well, today we're talking about the overturning of Roe versus Wade and asking, is it a victory for life or a step back for women's rights? Uh, Roe versus Wade was a landmark Supreme Court decision in 1973 that granted access to abortion across the whole of the US. Well, ever since pro-life groups have lobbied to have it overturned. And last month it happened as the US Supreme Court returned the power to individual states to decide their abortion policy. Well, the decision sparked both celebration and protest in equal measure. So was it a victory for the sanctity of life or a step back for women's rights? Uh, Lois McClatchy is a pro-life activist who works for ADF UK, a faith-based legal advocacy organisation, who have argued that Roe v. Wade was a bad law that needed repealing. Um, KS is my other guest, a pro-choice feminist who says that over the overturning of Roe v. Wade is a retrograde step for women. So Lois and KS, welcome to the show today. Um, Lois, perhaps we could start with you. And before you sort of give, you know, your views on, on the, this, this particular decision, perhaps you'd like to start by sketching out what Roe versus Wade is, um, you know, just a, a little bit of the background to what led up to that particular uh, Supreme Court decision in the first place almost 50 years ago. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Justin. So um, both lives are, are infinitely important in a pregnancy, but 50 years ago, seven men sitting on a, a panel decided for the entire nation of America uh, that it would become legal um, to have an abortion through all nine months of pregnancy for, for any reason, uh, which put America into a very radical position in the world. It, it was uh, one of only six countries uh, to allow such an extreme abortion regime uh, for any reason up to birth. Um, and on that list of six countries was, was North Korea and China. So, so not the best track record of upholding human rights on that list. Um, so it, it was a, a radical shift uh, in the way that we uh, pre uh, dissolved protections for, for unborn children, for women. Uh, but fortunately, what happened recently uh, was that that decision was reversed. Yeah. Um, KS, do you, do you want to sort of give a bit of your sort of thoughts on where the abortion sort of situation was, um, you know, perhaps even at the time, you know, that, that Roe versus Wade came in? Um, to, to what extent was that a contested law from the from the outset? Um, and yeah, and, and obviously then, yeah, happy to hear your thoughts on, on what it means now that it's been repealed. Sure. So Roe versus Wade was the kind of the culmination of a lot of feminist activism at that time. Um, a lot of the second wave feminists from the 1970s were very passionate about um, a woman's right to choose an abortion. And I think it had obviously very... Uh, good consequences. You know, I'm a feminist, so I think that it had uh, really incredible consequences. I would quibble with the uh, statement that it legalized abortion all nine months, because I think it legalized abortion until a viability, but then permitted states to apply regulations after that point. So it wasn't a complete uh, victory for, I guess, women's bodily autonomy rights <laughs> in the way many feminists hoped it would be. Um, that being said, I think it did uh, you know, allow for many women to uh, choose to end their pregnancies um, and pursue um, the lives that they wanted um, with because of that. And I think it's overturning is, you know, definitely devastating uh, for many reasons. Um, yeah. Do, do you want to spell out some of the reasons why why you you feel it was was obviously a, a retrograde step? KS? Sure. So we know uh, from just research on the subject that um, places that restrict abortion often have much worse uh, outcomes for both women and children, right? So we can look at um, the effects of pro-life policies in um, places like Texas in the past and places like Poland today. And we see that what happens is that women often die. Um, women's uh, lives and opportunities are often um, restricted because of that. Women have a harder time 
leaving abusive relationships. Um, we see the outcomes for children are often worse because women um, have children often when they're not ready. Um, in the United States in particular, uh, pro-life policies are also been associated with states that have um, very poor maternal and uh, health outcomes and outcomes for children. We don't have great social services. And so all those things are really concerning. Um, and I think, you know, aside from all those material effects, there's just a, a real shock and, and fear among women that like something that seems so fundamental is kind of being jerked away so fast. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see uh, an enormous uh, feminist pushback as a result of this. Well, well, let's let's turn to you, Lois. Why, why did you welcome this decision? What, what, why specifically do you think this is a, a step forward, not only for, I suppose, life, but for for women as well? Yeah, well, as someone who is is, is pro woman, I, I believe that women deserve much better than abortion. I was a little bit sad to hear um, you, you identified as a feminist chaos, but then you, you noticed that the, the you identified that women were able to have careers after Roe, and and I would like to us to see a society where where women can have children and careers. Uh, and that night they don't have to pick between uh, one or the other, but that both lives can flourish. Um, there is, you mentioned mortal mortality as well. Let me just respond to that. I know that um, uh, Poland and Malta uh, are two of the countries in Europe that have some of the greatest protections uh, for unborn life. Um, and they actually have the lowest rates uh, of maternal mortality in the world. So what we can learn from that is that um, Having uh, protections for unborn life can be very good for women and for children, and it's up to having great healthcare systems to support women and children that we see differences there. Uh, so I'm really excited to see this uh, step forward uh, in protecting women. Um, it's not done yet. There's a lot more to do to, to support every woman and child, uh, but this is a great marker of saying that actually as a society, uh, we can do um, a lot better uh, because we know that abortion is actually uh, often not seen or is not the best outcome for women, even if you are a supportive of abortion or, or not. Most people would agree uh, that women don't necessarily uh, start their uh, coming to their 20s saying that they would like one. Um, mental health outcomes are actually much poorer uh, for women after abortion. There's a, a causal link has been identified uh, through academic research between abortion and suicide, uh, which is a tragedy. Uh, which is something that we can do far better on. Um, so, uh, yeah, I was, I'm excited to see how we can do better with this start over the US and, and, and seeing how we can do better here in Europe and the UK as well. Would you like to respond to any of those sort of responses? Yeah, KS. Yeah, so when I say that um, losing abortion rights uh, is a step back for women and that, you know, women's life outcomes are affected, I certainly am not saying that women who have children can't have careers or women who have children can't go to college or anything like that. But we just know that um, having children at an inopportune time makes those things harder and some women won't be able to pursue those goals. And so, um, you know, I think it's uh, easy to say, well, you know, it's possible to that women can pursue both things. But the fact is that we know that it does make it a lot harder. And sometimes some women um, won't be able to do it. And sometimes, um, you know, women will really struggle as a result. So. I, I think uh, re regarding, you know, empirical studies, I, I can provide plenty that would um, contradict, I think, some of the statements Lois is making about, um, you know, mental health outcomes, particularly of forced pregnancy um, versus abortion. Uh, and so, you know, I don't know how fruitful it would be to kind of just go back and forth about like different studies, but I think that it would be, um, it, there are certainly plenty that show, you know, the opposite, which is that women who get abortions are often much happier and able to leave abusive relationships, pursue what they wish um, versus women who are forced to carry pregnancies that they don't want. I mean, we'll, we'll come to the ethical issues and, and I will, you know, we'll, we'll get into this, you know, a lot more as we go and, and I'll give you a chance to respond, Lois, but um I mean, just just sticking with the the ramifications of this change itself. Um, where where I mean, a lot of people have responded, Lois, as though you know, abortion has been outlawed altogether in the U.S. Now, that's obviously not quite what's happened here. Can you just explain what what this actually means in practice, in terms of it no longer being, as it were, mandated at a you know the the, the overall level in the U.S. Yes, exactly. So uh, the court has decided that that was the wrong way to make a decision. Uh, like I said at the story, it was, it was seven men who brought around uh, Roe v. Wade, uh, which made it possible, um, as Chaos pointed out, possible for every state to 
uh, to legalize abortion all the way up to birth. Uh, and some did. Um, and there was um, a lot, many, many lives lost uh, across the state. Um, now, that decision will go back to the, the people. It will go back to democracy. Every state will be able to decide uh, through, through elected representatives, as it should always have been, uh, how they want to best care uh, for women and children. Uh, so this is a, a pivotal moment. It, uh, but it, 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 you are right, Justin. It, it has been a little bit mis misunderstood here uh, in Europe that it, it seems to be that that um, that, that is completely that, that abortion has completely been eradicated. It hasn't, but it has come back to more of a European standard. So in Europe, the average um, protection for life uh, in European countries falls around about after twelve weeks. Um, which is is much uh, better protection than, than we've seen in, in most states uh, pre roe So actually, states are given the option to come towards a more European model, uh, which is seen as a little bit more humane uh, to be able to protect lives. And and what what are you seeing yourself, KS, now on the ground, as it were? What 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 will this look like in states? Presumably, there are some states which will still have very liberal abortion laws and 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 so on. Um, but presumably there will be other states who, you know, roll back to a more conservative perspective. Um, so, 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 what can you give us a few examples of what what will happen in 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 practice now? Sure. So we're going to see, like Lois said, we're going to see a whole patchwork of um, different legal restrictions on abortion. So, you know, I live in Washington State, which has very strong protections. Um, basically, they've codified Roe into our into law here. So, um, I'm personally not. Um, going to be affected by um, abortion restrictions, but um, other states are going to restrict it possibly completely. Um, you know, there are different laws in different states that restrict it some to 12 weeks, some to six weeks, um, some to 18. And I think um, you're just going to see like a lot of churn and um, women like fleeing pro-life states to go to pro-choice states to get an abortion. Um, you know, probably the rise of a lot of illegal abortions in states like Texas, um, which we hope are not as deadly as they were in the past with um, the rise of, of abortion pills. So I, um, you know, it is a very worrisome thing. And I think I'm not a legal expert by any means, but I think this is going to get very, very messy. And um, I, I'm a little worried about the future there for sure. I'll come back to you, Lois, in a moment for a response on that issue of whether restricting abortion is then more dangerous because of, you know, backstreet abortion and, and, and unregulated practices and so on. But but why do you think this was overturned then, Case? If this is such a bad news for women, why why did the judges take that view? Why, you know, and obviously there are a good number in the US who are celebrating with Lois on this. Oh, sure. I mean, you know, I'm not, like I said, I'm not a legal expert. Uh, it's hard to avoid the conclusion that um, the conservative turn in the in the court has um, caused this. You know, the Supreme Court has made a number of very um, traditionally conservative rulings recently. The latest was uh, about the EPA, um, kind of restricting uh, some really helpful policies regarding that. And so, um, you know, as to the why, I think it probably has a lot to do with this rightward shift in the courts. Um, now. Uh, that, with all that being said, I actually agree with Lois in some regards in that I don't think um, Roe versus Wade was ever the really strong protection of abortion rights that um, women wanted. I, I really feel like both sides were a little unsatisfied with um, how it turned out. I mean, you know, if you if you think about abortion rights, the first thing that comes to mind, whether you're pro-life or pro-choice, is not really privacy, right? That seems like kind of a strange thing to build the case around. And that's kind of what feminists noted even in the 1970s. Catherine McKinnon has a great piece on that. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, a lot of uh, mixed feelings about this and, uh, you know, a lot of fear, but a lot of hope that we're moving in a better direction. Uh, from your perspective, where do, where does this leave uh, the states, Lois? Chaos, you know, refers to it as a patchwork now, and ultimately, in some states, it will make it more dangerous for women. She says because in more conservative, you know, where there are tighter restrictions, women might go and do, you know, go to unregulated back backstreet abortions and so on. Um, is that a concern of of yours? Um, do you see a rise in um, 
you know, uh, dangerous types of abortion taking place when it's restricted? No, in developed countries, uh, as the US is, um, there is very limited or very little rise in, in death from abortion after um, abortion is um, restricted. Um, as I said earlier about Malta and Poland having the lowest um, de uh, maternal death rates in the world and having some of the best protections for life, we actually see it comes down to healthcare provision uh, and what and how society and, and, and yeah, over to the states as well, how they can um, provide better to support women and support unborn children. So there is work to be done uh, to make sure that every life is protected. Um, but we won't, I, 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 there's limited uh, reason to believe that there would be more uh, death and dangerous abortion uh, because of that in, in, a, in a developed country like the US. And that's un uh, actually true across other parts of the world as well. Uh, where we can see studies from, from Rwanda, from Ethiopia, uh, and Chile, and, and other countries where, where when abortion has become more restricted, when lives have been more protected from earlier stages, we haven't necessarily seen uh, a rise in deaths. Um, so there isn't a causal link there. Um, when it comes over to uh, the court and the um, direction there, yeah, I, I, um, chaos represents a lot of, of pro-choice people and pro-life people who, who agree that uh, Roe v. Wade was a bad law. And so I think, yeah, it's I, I pulled a quote earlier from, from Justice Ruth, Gator, yeah, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, um, who was well known to be a, a very pro-abortion uh, justice. Um, and she even herself said that, um, Roe was a heavy-handed judicial intervention uh, which prolongs divisiveness and deferred stable settlement of the issue on abortion. So um, this definitely is a very contentious um, law. So, so both sides, I think, are, are quite right to see, you know, be pleased with it being overturned. Oh, I just want to say I'm not happy about Roe being overturned, but I, um, I agree with Lois that it was never as strong or as strong as we would have liked um, a defense of abortion rights. And so... Um, you know, going forward, I suspect we're going to see uh, much more grassroots feminist movements in these states that are really restricting abortion. I think we're already starting to see that. And um, I'm hoping that this tide will start to turn and we'll see much better laws that are stronger and, and more secure being put into place. There, there have been claims, you know, I've seen it surface on social media and elsewhere that in some places this will mean that women can now be prosecuted for ha simply having a miscarriage you know that there is there are laws that would i mean i don't know where that comes from what what kind of interpretation of a law that that would look like lois do you do you know what, where those sorts of claims originate from um they're, yeah no they're, they're not true pro lifers don't campaign for laws that that uh would prosecute a miscarriage pro lifers don't see miscarriage as abortion um so yeah, that that is uh, fundamentally untrue um, and there would be support uh, and protection and yeah, for, for women who face those terrible situations. Oh, I'll uh, jump in there because I disagree, mainly because we've already seen examples of women getting prosecuted for miscarriage. A great example is Brittany Pula, who was convicted of man manslaughter um, because prosecutors believe she had caused her miscarriage, which uh, most people outside of the court case disagreed with. So she faces, I think, four years in prison for that. Um, and yeah, so yeah. I, I do think a lot of the stories that, that hit the media in support of that uh, often don't cover a lot of the detail involved or, or so it's, while examples are good, they're important to really look behind some of the headlines on. Um, but I would say that um, abortion laws or abortion restrictions don't even prosecute a woman if the abortion is done to save her life. So far less would they prosecute uh, miscarriage, but in instances, um, in the, for example, if, if a miscarriage was to be prosecuted, it would only ever be related to if another crime has been committed to cause the miscarriage. For example, in um, if a drug offence um, has been committed and, and there are miscarriages happen because of, of that kind of crime, and then it would be a part two um, or related, but it would never be an independent crime. So well, then I think we should clarify that miscarriages will at times be prosecuted, right? Because if it is in conjunction with those situations, they will be. And uh, regarding... Um, prosecuting women for getting abortions. Um, well, I think actually a lot of pro-life activists have like a very, I'd say a very naive view of the law where they're like, if the law says that women won't get prosecuted, it will never happen. But that's not really how things work in the real world. As an example, we just saw a couple of weeks ago, Lizzie, uh, Lizelle Herrera was prosecuted for inducing an abortion under the Texas law. And the charges were dropped, but only after she'd spend like several days in jail 
been extremely traumatized and so on. And so these laws are going to cause um, a lot of turmoil among women uh, who are suspected of causing an abortion, who maybe had a miscarriage, but people aren't sure. Um, it's going to cause like uh, stress and trauma. And I, I think we should not pretend otherwise there. We've already seen that happening. Even in those those instances, uh, you know, going back to whether, you know, going behind the headlines, et cetera, any such instances would be extremely, extremely rare. We have to legislate on, on the majority circumstances. And uh, so I think the fundamental issue here is about um, the right to life and the right to, uh, yeah, for 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 a, for a baby to and and protecting women as well um, from the trauma of abortion. So I think like that that's a very very narrow uh, circumstance that if it should, if it should ever well arise. that's that's true. But we've also only seen um, you know Roe versus Wade overturned for what like a couple days now. So it's hard to to kind of say oh it's not going to be a big deal. It's not going to be a problem when we we have already seen cases of it happening. And um, we have every reason to believe that these cases are going to increase, particularly because I think states are really going to have a hard time enforcing these laws. Um, like I said, abortion pills are fairly accessible via mail um, in a lot of places. And I, I am really worried about how states are going to deal with the fact that women are probably going to turn to illegal uh, abortions going out of state, etc. For this, for these matters. Do, do you think that... Um ultimately it should be the abortion providers if they are breaking the law in a particular state that should be uh prosecuted or or do you think there is a a time and a place when a woman herself may be prosecuted for seeking an abortion that perhaps falls outside of the 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 rules of a particular state let me go back first uh to what ks was, was addressing first um and then i think that um we should be making sure that the law enforcement uh, meets the standard required um, for human rights to be upheld, for um, society to function. And the answer to, to bad law enforcement is not change the law to make it to make it worse, but to make sure that law enforcement comes to meet the standard of the law. Um, so I think in, instead of circulating bad instances, uh, we should aim higher. We should we should aim for for a state where. Um, where that would be the case, and yeah, I mean, let's like look at where this uh, this goes. But um, yeah, it, it would certainly seem plausible that um, abortion providers would be uh, culpable um, in such circumstances. But let's wait and see how how things shake out. So I would address that too, because that that argument always seemed. I actually just wrote something about this. The idea of prosecuting abortion providers but not women in an abortion is a very um, bizarre position to take. I think. Um, it's a bit, bit like saying, you know, if you if you hire a hitman to kill someone, uh, you know, from the pro-life perspective, you aren't culpable, but the hitman should face all the charges. Or if you buy a gun from someone and use that gun to kill kill someone, uh, you know, that would be like saying that, you know, you aren't to be charged, but the person who sold you the gun should be charged. So immediately there's very weird ethical implications um, to this approach. That don't really make sense to me and I think don't make sense to a lot of people, which is one of the reasons that I think that um, these laws, even if they seem right now to be, um, you know, leaving women in the free and clear, I kind of suspect these laws will eventually start coming down on women who get abortions because it just doesn't really make sense. <laughs> I think probably a reason to um, um, to not prosecute women, and I, I think I would fall in this, and it is a really interesting discussion. Uh, the reason to not uh, prosecute women, which is, is my current position, would be because they are often actually unaware um, of um, the the true all the facts about abortion. Uh, they're often not given they're, the media is often not being honest about what an abortion is and what it entails. Uh, often we haven't heard the true story of um, what a human being is like. It at six weeks, at 12 weeks, at 15 weeks gestation. Um, and they're often also uh, under a lot of pressure. I know in, in, in my country, the UK, um, that a recent BBC survey found that between one in 10 and one in five women turn out to an abortion clinic feeling that they've been pressured into the decision, whether that's by a partner, parents, friends, maybe it's even by socioeconomic circumstances, but they say that they felt pressured and coerced. Um, so there is a lot of, of reason and, and, and discussion in there uh, about why a woman would not be prosecuted, but it's yeah, obviously a much, much wider discussion. And I've heard those arguments as well, um, but my final thought on that is just, to me, um, th 
those would be more like extenuating circumstances that you would, you know, use to like give someone a lesser sentence, for example. They're not really reason to charge the provider and not charge the pregnant woman, particularly because if you are going by the standard that the women don't really understand it's a human life, well, certainly abortion providers would seem to be vulnerable to that same misinformation, although I would not call that misinformation. But, um, you, you know, it, like the same logic should apply to them and not just the women if you think it's a, a case of not understanding the true value of human life or something along those lines. Like at least one of the circumstances that, that I mentioned is, is definitely usually uh, the norm in that it's um, often uh, often due to circumstances of pressure. Um, and that, um, yeah, I think there is a general like lack of awareness in our society right now about um, everything that abortion entails for women. So I'd say that those are still probably quite, quite solid. Let, let's, 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 let's move, because the, naturally the conversation is moving from the law itself to, to the ethical dimension of this. And we're, we're going to do that in the next part of the show. And I know that in particular, the issue of personhood is an important one for UKS in terms of deciding where the rights lie and, you know, the priorities we should, how we should weigh those up. Um, and, and, of course, one of the, the main slogans that has been, you know, around and when people have been protesting this recent change has been my body, my choice. Uh, I just want to talk about some of those issues with you both, if that's OK, in the next section. And um, and so we'll, we'll turn to those ethical issues. We're, we're talking about a, a big issue, a hot button issue. Um, it's very topical in the US at the moment. The overturning of Roe versus Wade. And my guests today are Lois McClatchy and KS. Uh, I'll make sure there are links to both of their websites where you can find out more about them with today's show. But we'll be back in just a moment's time. had some rough experiences over the summer and about a month ago, I think I can say this, I would say I found God. It's kind of like the Israelites during the Exodus. Their initial experiences with God were so strong that they were led out of Egypt, but they weren't enough to keep the Israelites satisfied in the long run. Welcome back to today's show. We're talking about abortion today, particularly the overturning of Roe versus Wade. Uh, a landmark decision from 1973 has been met by another landmark decision uh, just last month. And obviously it's it's been met with celebration by pro-lifers, uh, a huge amount of protest and consternation from the pro-choice side of this. Um, and, and both of those perspectives represented today, Lois McClatchy, pro-life activist with ADF UK and uh, KS, a pro-choice feminist. Um, so I wanted to turn to the, to the ethical kind of side of this because ultimately this, this, this to some extent determines what your view of what the law should be is anyway. Um, as I say, one of the most common sort of slogans you see around this is is my body, my choice, that, that sort of issue of the bodily autonomy you've already sort of said about, about uh, that, that is so important, KS, for, for women. Um, so uh, what, yeah, just explain what you understand by that slogan, KS, my body, my choice. Um, is it basically that if, yeah, if you, if a, a woman has a total say over what happens uh, to her body and within her body uh, and, and that should be protected by law, essentially? Um, not quite. I would say, you know, obviously my body, my choice doesn't mean that, you know, someone has the right to do whatever they want with their body and that would violate a lot of laws. Um, but it is a sort of shorthand expression to describe um, the importance of bodily autonomy to women. So that's the right to like use your bodily resources in the way you wish, right? And the fact that you're not obligated to to give up those resources, um, even to save the life of another of another person or another fetus, uh, depending on your personal view of that. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great slogan. I definitely think it, it is very focused on the bodily autonomy argument, uh, not so much the personhood side of things, which is um, uh, the one that I'm more interested in. But I think it's, you know, I, I'm a believer that bodily autonomy arguments are actually quite successful. And so uh, I have no real problem with it. I just think like all slogans, you know, 
it's not enough to repeat a slogan. You actually have to have some theory behind it and, you know, arguments. And so that's part of what I've been um, really interested in uh, developing. Yeah. And, but, but, but it's, 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 here's a hypothetical. Okay. Say, say in a scenario where perhaps, you know, there's myself and one other person and they they've lost a great deal of blood in an accident. And I could, if I just gave them a pint of blood, save their life, but I cannot be charged or, you know, be criminalized for simply choosing not to do that. That's, that's the kind of, is that the kind of bodily autonomy you're talking about? That if I choose not to do something that saves another person's life, that, that kind of interferes with my bodily autonomy, that I, I cannot be held culpable for their, for their death or, or anything like that. Yeah, I think that's pretty much what a lot of um, pro-choice or a lot of autonomy arguments slash like the slogan is getting at. Um, you know, it, it does seem like people often say, um, you know, if you found out someone needed a kidney transplant and you were the only one available to give that kidney transplant, you wouldn't be obligated to do so. Um, and so that suggests that sort of the right to life doesn't sort of beat out, if you will, um, the right to bodily autonomy. Um, even if that person will die without that transplant, you still aren't obligated to give that to them. And so, of course, that's very important for women, right? Because women throughout history have often had their bodily autonomy rights completely disregarded. You know, they've often been treated as little better than slaves historically. Um, so, you know, this is a very sensitive and, and personal mm. issue for many women. Yeah. Okay, Lois, what, what do you make of that bodily autonomy argument then? Sure, sure. Well, I support my body, my choice in terms of I support everybody. Um, and obviously the, uh, the, the baby inside a woman is a, a distinct living and whole, uh, human being. I support the, their rights to, to their body as well. Um, I think that the, um, chaos brought up the, the idea of a kidney transplant and, and, and it's right. In that, in that situation, you aren't obligated to give your kidney, uh, to stop someone else from dying. But in that case, you would be stopping them from, from an inevitable death. Um, but in terms of um, a pregnancy, that's a little bit different because you would be intentionally uh, making a move to end their life, which, which I believe is, is a slightly different circumstance. Um, if we kind of bring this kind of scenario and into a, something like outside the womb, too, that we can imagine a little better, because sometimes it's quite hard to conceptualize uh, a baby in the womb. But if we think about, for example, conjoined twins, um, they are um, two individuals who are dependent on each other uh, for life, but we recognize and we enter as a society that it would be wrong to end the life of one. Um, so I think in this circumstance, um, the, the right to life is, is uh, important to be upheld and we find solutions to, to best protect both lives in that scenario. So um, I'll respond to that. Uh, first, um, I think you were kind of hitting on that distinction between killing and letting die. And I think that's an important distinction to think about. But if you apply it to abortion, it's a little bit strange because there are certainly types of abortions that do not involve direct killing. I think um, there's one called, I'm probably going to say this wrong, hysterotomy, right? Where you just remove the uterus. Um, that would be more of a situation of letting die, right? Because you're not directly killing the fetus, but you're simply removing it from the body and it simply can't survive outside the woman's body. Another might be medication abortion, right? Which simply makes the woman's body in, inhospitable for the developing embryo. Um, and so neither of those, strictly speaking, involve killing. They involve either removing or uh, changing the, the um, features of the body to make uh, the... Uh, uh, make the life inhospitable, I suppose, for the embryo slash fetus. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can make that distinction, but I think it it only really gets you so far in, in a pro from a pro-life perspective. And there are further arguments you can develop that say, you know, if you think those kinds of abortions are acceptable, then um, it's a bit odd to simply say that other forms that are much less damaging um, are are unacceptable. Like, you know, you're just basically saying you can only uh, bring about the death of the fetus in a certain way, which is a little strange, although some people might accept it. Sure. No, I'll just, I'll just push, back, push back on that a little. Um, if you, an abortion would remove uh, a child from its natural habitat and it would deprive it of oxygen. It would deprive it of the things that it's been, been living on. And I think that that's, that is still killing. It's still uh, distinct um, from, from the choosing not to save. Um, I think that, that we do have to have a, a clear distinction there. Um, I think legally speaking, coming at this from a kind of like human rights law perspective, which is which is my background actually, um, often this is kind of weighed up as 
the fundamental right to life versus um, bodily autonomy. Um, and that's an interesting concept. So the right to life uh, in international law um, is um, cherished in some of the most important international legal documents, the ICCPR, which is kind of one of the very cornerstones of human rights. And, and it's quite a unique, uh, it's one of few human rights which are, are not qualified. Um, so other rights have extenuating circumstances um, where they can be limited a little, for example, in the time of a national crisis. Um, human rights law allows the government to suspend some rights, but they do not allow the government to suspend the right to life. So that seems very fundamental. On the other hand, bodily autonomy is obviously something that's very, very important. And, and I don't deny that it's very important. It's bodily autonomy for sure. But at the same time, we've seen in times of national crisis uh, that the government are allowed to a certain extent to, to limit national, uh, limit bodily autonomy, bodily autonomy. Uh, for the good of a nation, for a greater good uh, in a time of national emergency. So we can see from a legal perspective that the freedom, that the right to life does um, become become a little bit more significant and important in that balance. Uh, so we should find ways to, to support both the woman and, and the baby in the pregnancy. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll respond to that really quick because, uh, you know, I think... Um, uh, there's a problem with sort of uh, comparing pregnancy with other um, sorts of things like, say, getting a vaccine um, that involve much less degree of harm slash transformation slash, um, you know, massive effects on a woman's life and well-being and future. And so uh, I often hear people say like, oh, well, if, you know, you make vaccines mandatory, that's like a violation of autonomy. And so that means that autonomy generally can be disregarded with regard to abortion. And I would push back on that simply because I think the degree of sort of insult or uh, harm or, um, uh, or, or problems that, that um, uh, pregnancy brings about is actually very relevant and should not be sort of disregarded in favor of like this. If you, if you a little bit uh, can be sacrificed, then, then it all can be. I would compare uh, pregnancy more, more to um, organ donation, right? I, I they actually have very similar uh, fatality rates um, donating a kidney. And I think very few people would find the idea of forced kidney donations, forced organ donations um, as a way to alleviate some kind of ill. Um, very few people would find that to be um, an acceptable uh, acceptable cost, I guess, for any good. Mm -hmm. Pregnancy and, and vaccines are undeniably different, for sure. I absolutely agree. They're, they are different things. Um, but I would say pregnancy is, is even more significant in this scenario because it involves another human life um, directly. Um, and that human life would be very compromised in that issue. So I would say the heightened stakes um, are even more significant for the, for the argument that, um, that both lives should be protected. And, and and if I could jump in here, Chaos, obviously the, the, the big distinction for, for Lois between a, a kidney and uh, an unborn baby is that there's a, there's a very different moral difference between removing, you know, a, a, essentially a, an organ or a vestigial organ or whatever to the baby. And, and this is obviously where we come to the, the second issue, which is, well, what are we talking about here? Because that is obviously going to make a huge difference. So it's the personhood of... So, so Lois said, well... It's not one. It's not one body you're talking about. It's two bodies. There's a the body of another child. You're not just removing a sort of a, a clump of cells or you know whatever a fetus. Um, it's it's a baby. It's a person. It's a human, and and that body has rights. If you're talking about bodily autonomy, so so why for you is that not the same the same as as the well? Kind I would of be careful the there because we're not comparing a kidney to a fetus. First of all, um, when I use that example the there i'm assuming that there's a person who will die without a kidney transplant right so that would be the thing that's comparable to the fetus so um uh the reason that women pro-choice women often go directly to bodily autonomy arguments is that they kind of often want to just die bypass the personhood debate and immediately ta start talking about well even if it was a person we would not think this was justified um, so I, I just wanted to kind of clarify what was actually being compared there. What, well, what? Well, thank you for the clarification. But, but I suppose it, it does still lead to the the question of of the you know the moral status of uh, the unborn child. So what's? Um, I mean, even the language I think is is interesting because you've obviously chosen to to, to talk about a fetus, an embryo. You, would you not use the word baby for? Uh, a, a, a you know a child that hasn't come to term uh, during pregnancy. I mean, you could use the term. I don't think it really 
has an impact on kind of the ethics or uh, of the discussion, what term you use. Um, but I have noticed that pro-life people often insist on using specific terms to kind of create like an emotional effect um, and suggest that women who use like just the scientifically accurate terms are um, being heartless and so on. And so I, I try to avoid using sort of loaded language like that. Uh, although, you know, you know, if you talk to people on the street, I, I have no problem using those terms. But um, oftentimes using those terms suggests an agreement with the pro-life position that uh, the fetus is similar or comparable in moral status to the baby or the embryo or the, you know, the zygote or the embryo is also comparable to a child or a person. And that's something I would challenge for sure. What, what's your feeling on the language before we get to the, the sort of the philosophical issue of, of, of the, the person? Oh, sure. I mean, so, so whale, when, when whales are pregnant, they have, um, whale fetuses. When, when sheep are pregnant, they have, um, sheep fetuses. Uh, when humans are pregnant, they have, um, human fetuses, which is the correct uh, terminology scientifically. But when do you look at that? If you, have you ever seen a, th- a 3D ultrasound? It's amazing. You can see what's in there. And it's it's a baby. I've seen, I've held babies in my arms. And, you know, a few weeks before they were in the womb and they, they look the same in there as they were outside. So I don't think it's it's location or geography uh, that changes um, that term. Perhaps one's more colloquial or one's more scientific, but they're, I think they are the same thing. And we're I'm very comfortable using the term uh, baby to describe a human baby in a, in a human womb. I mean, coming back to you then, KS, on, on this issue, regardless of, the, of the, the language we may choose to use or not, what, what, what for you makes the, the key distinction between the personhood of the mother and the personhood of um, the child or fetus or whatever in, in the womb? Well, um I think first to understand that we should understand the pro-life perspective, which is essentially that personhood is simply determined by being a, an organism of type homo sapiens. And usually they kind of treat this as if it's simply a scientific question and not an ethical question. And I think that that's simply incorrect. Um, so to clarify that, I would say there are certainly human organisms that I think are uncontroversially not persons or that we would agree do not have a right to life. So the most common example people bring up is at the end of life, right? When you have someone who is, let's say, permanently comatose and you're like, well, you know, th- there comes a time where we might, you know, choose either euthanasia or, you know, we might switch off the life support and allow that person to pass. We don't consider that murder because we no longer consider that uh, uh, human organism to be a person, <laughs> really, right? It's no longer something that has a right to life. It no longer has a right to... Um, you know, to those, uh, uh, to that bodily support. And so we can use that um, sort of example to think about um, when right to life might apply to the fetus. And um, in short, I would argue that um, a right to life starts to apply when that fetus begins to have some sort of psychological experience. And that, by that, I usually mean Um, People will usually say when that fetus acquires consciousness of some kind, when there's something it's like to be the fetus as opposed to, um, you know, just some other like, you know, human cells, right? And so it then becomes kind of a scientific matter of determining when um, that consciousness arises. And that's, I think, when um, we should really consider personhood to begin. And I think this view has some other advantages, too, in that it um, allows for kind of a broader acceptance of um, animals as persons, right? So the the pro-life view tends to restrict personhood to human organisms. It suggests that personhood is simply identical to um, being a human organism. And I think as people have become more influenced by the environmentalist movement and, you know, works by, by Peter Singer and so on, they've come to believe that um, animals too have psychological experiences and they you know, should not suffer unnecessarily and so on. And so they've come to have kind of a broader view of personhood in that way. Hmm. Lois, feel free to respond. Uh, let me start by saying that, that human, the premise of human rights uh, depends on human equality. And we know from historic examples, we know from human experience that that equality cannot come from any sort of merit that we earn. It can't come from our gender. It can't come from the color of our skin. It can't come from anything else and when you boil it down to what is the fundamental thing that makes all humans equal 
It's that we are fundamentally all part of the human family. Um, now, let me get, pick up on, on, on the first point uh, that KS raised about euthanasia, which is incredibly controversial, um, especially given that it, in most of Europe it is not um, legal. It is, it is considered uh, very much a crime to end a person's uh, life like that. Um, we use the term kind of human organism, you know, to, to describe this, this human being who, who is not considered a person anymore. But uh, I think if you ask a doctor in the hospital what the families uh, are saying, why they're ending that person's life, they very rarely say, oh, well, this human organism is no longer a person. Um, that's, that's not how we view it and, and treat uh, human beings. And um, even if, if you are someone who thinks that the euthanasia is the, the right and ethical decision at that point, you would, I would be very uh, concerned and surprised if you think that it's okay to do anything you want to that human body. If you think it's all right to, to draw on their face, if you think it's all right to disrespect uh, their body, to, to use them for abuse, for, for anything like that. So clearly they hold a distinct moral value uh, over and above uh, what other uh, creatures hold. I was interested about the, the point on animals uh, to consider that, that, that they are persons when um, to me, it's very clear from a human rights law perspective, at least, that, that they do not hold the gamble of, of basic rights uh, that we instinctively know as humans. Uh, the right to life, maybe that's debatable for, for vegans, etc., except that it's, uh, maybe some people believe that they have a fundamental right to life, but we're certainly, you know, the right to health care, the right to education, all, all of these things we, we don't attribute to animals. So I think in, intuitively we don't consider them persons. So when it comes to where we are drawing uh, what makes a person a person, it has to be the thing that, that we share most of all fundamentally. And at the end of the day, it, it, the only way to ensure true equality and to, to uphold this basis in which we built our society, in which we have built a human rights law and, and established the equality of all people, is that we are simply human. So I'll respond. To, there's a couple of good points in there that I'd like to respond to. So the first is kind of this concern that um, if we assign personhood or consider personhood to be something that arises from having sort of psychological experiences, that that will somehow exclude, um, you know, oppressed groups or maybe lead to some sort of, you know, uh, terrible genocide of certain minorities or something like that. I've heard that a lot, right? So there's kind of a fear there. And I'll just say that, you know, I think that fear is only valid if you believe that there are some groups of minorities or oppressed people that simply have no inner lives, no experiences, no psychological capabilities, which seems self-evidently false. And I'd also add that, you know, creating a biological basis for personhood is itself very open to um, abuse. You know, uh, most fascist regimes uh, have, you know, called certain groups subhuman, and they've usually argued that those group, you know, the groups of people are um, you know, biologically inferior or they simply don't have the exact type of human biology that they think is relevant. And so um, you know, I think uh, this idea that we are safe, um, we can only be safe if we sort of grant uh, uh, personhood to everything of type homo sapiens or whatever you'd like to call it. Um, the idea that, that, that we're safe that way is, is, is simply not true. Um, and it, I, I think the idea that there's risk with my view um, is also not true, since we all agree, hopefully, <laughs> that like there are no no minority groups that have no inner lives, no no personalities, and so on. Just just before Lois responds to that, just to tease that out a bit more, KS. I mean, if if the 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 issue is at what point the the baby or fetus develops what you describe a kind of psychological sort of ability value and and that sort of then imbues the the baby with certain rights at that point do you do you have a rough idea of when that is it, i mean would that be at some point within the pregnancy um and or would it be even fall outside of the the pregnancy after their birth or something like that you know i think at that point you basically have to look at the scientific research right to get some idea and um I would generally say as a good standard, I think that personhood should begin when some organism has like an initial consciousness of some kind, right? Even if it's very basic. And so I've done a lot of research on this myself and I found that the best place for that is at birth. So uh, that always sounds like a little uh, too pat, I suppose, but uh, it actually makes a lot of sense because um, it has to do with basically the, the uterine environment. So the uterine environment is a, a kind of a low oxygen environment that has a lot of um, 
as a result, um, essentially has a lot of hormones that cause basically sedation of the fetus throughout pregnancy. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of research on kind of animal research or, you know, reading papers by animal researchers on this subject that I've collected on my blog. And so I think the most reasonable uh, place for, you know, considering the beginning of personhood is when that fetus leaves that body, when it's, you know, exposed to air and kind of shocked into alertness. Um, I think everyone's kind of seen a birth has probably seen that transformation. Um, and so that's where I would personally draw the line. Now, other researchers say, well, I would prefer, right. or other philosophers, I should say, usually look at some kind of neurological milestone. And um, they usually say, well, around 28 weeks is when the cerebral cortex um, begins to form. And the cerebral cortex is responsible for sort of the thought and cognition um, and so that's when we should um, consider the fetus to be a person. And so you'll get different answers about that. But I think the important thing to remember is that whatever you, wherever you draw that line, re kind of cognition or psychological psychology, the vast majority of abortions happen well before it. So, um, you know, I find it usually helpful to get some kind of agreement about those early abortions that form the vast majority of them before discussing those edge cases. Okay, Lo Lois, go ahead and your your response to that. So, I mean, in terms of a, a kind of a scientific response, but then also a, a kind of more philosophical side as well. Um, and and you've um, you know gone into this in, in a great de deal, KS. Um, but my thoughts are that you know we have evidence that at the end of the first trimester, you know, if you have twins in the womb, they are much more careful when they're flailing their arms around their twins faces because they know that that is uh, something that's a more sensitive area than they are when in other spaces we know that they respond to touch they respond to uh different voices to music sometimes so we do know that there's some level of response to them and that makes that argument quite difficult about where to really pin that down but what i would like to do is kind of let's bring this out of the womb because like i said sometimes it's easier to to envision what it's like for, for a child who's outside of the womb or even for myself i know that there's uh, I spend a great majority of my 24 hours asleep or a great time of my 24 hours asleep and I'm not conscious at that point. So does my person who kind of go up and down during the day depending on on how conscious I am and, and doesn't that cause problems for where we are? But but let's say like for if I was to take the point and say, okay, um, even if our value does depend on consciousness, surely that can't be exactly why we are valuable as humans. Um, not only because that would be kind of depending on, on my sleeping capability or, or someone's unconsciousness after an accident and coming back. Um, but it also, that indicates to me that it has to, that argument has to allow some sort of capacity for consciousness. I'm asleep, but I will wake up. I've been in an accident, but, but maybe I'll recover. But if that is the case, is it okay then, in your opinion, to, for people who are in that state, um, to be mistreating them? Let's even put it back in them. Let's put um, this back to the abortion question. If we had kind of a form, this is kind of a horrible thing to imagine. If we had a form uh, of unconscious fetuses from an early age, and, and, and we took many of them out of the womb, and they, they were not conscious, but they were, were there existing human, whole human beings. And we created lots of these, and, and we used them for experiments, or we used them for abuse, for, for gratification, for weird and, and difficult and unethical things. Would that be unethical um, in your perspective uh, because they aren't conscious? Or is there a moral, we have to have a moral respect for a human being, even if they're not conscious? Well, so a couple things. One, my argument really isn't just that like only conscious beings or only conscious humans have personhood. Um, it's to say that um, personhood begins with an initial consciousness and ends with like that final consciousness. Like, you know, when someone enters like a permanent coma, say, I would say that that's no longer a person. And I think we intuitively see that there's a distinction between, um, say, you know, going to someone who's temporarily under anesthesia and taking off their life support machine and going to someone who is, you know, permanently comatose, say, or, and turning off their life support machine. Obviously, the person who is just under anesthesia still has, um, you know, mental states, desires, even if they're not turning their attention to them at that time. So I just want to kind of highlight that my argument is not that, you know, you have to be conscious to uh, have personhood. Um, that, that, I think, is kind of a misstatement. 
Now, I think you made one other interesting point about um, corpses, or sorry, about like mistreating. Uh, I, I, I'm like thinking of something else, I, like or about uh, mistreating, uh, like uh, uh, you know, mistreating like bodies or or and so on. And the suggestion seems to be, and I agree, like it's immoral to to mistreat um, you know a body that's permanently comatose. Like you shouldn't like draw on its face or whatever. Um, and I would say that that's also true about like a dead body or a corpse, right? Like we shouldn't mistreat a corpse. You know, it's obviously immoral to do all sorts of icky things there. Um, but that the immorality of that does not come from the fact that that dead body is a person or that that human organism is a person. The immorality of that comes from, you know, the fact that we might just think it's vicious or grotesque or something else to do those things. And I would argue that that, that is not analogous to abortion. But but why is it? We'll, we'll, we'll come back to you for a response to this, Lois, in just a moment. Sorry, we're going to go to our final break and, and then I'll, I'll allow, allow you to come straight back on this. Um, we were kind of deep into the kind of ethical and philosophical arguments here on Unbelievable on, on abortion. Um, we'll be continuing it uh, uh, as we begin to draw our conversation to a close. Lois McClatchy and KS from Defending Feminism are my guests today. Have you ever found yourself tongue-tied when someone asks you, is there evidence for God? What about suffering? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? I'd like to introduce you to Confident Christianity, our online apologetics course, featuring video training from world-renowned thinkers such as William Lane Craig, John Lennox, Amy Or Ewing and Gary Habermas, you'll learn how to understand, defend and share your faith with confidence. I'll also share lessons I've learned from over 15 years of hosting atheists and Christians in dialogue. You can enrol now at premier.org.uk forward slash course or click the link with this video. Well, we've been having a really interesting uh, ethical discussion towards the end of today's uh, program as we've been looking at this uh, Roe versus Wade decision. Um, Lois McClatchy from ADF UK and KS from Defending Feminism are both with me today. If you want the, the websites, by the way, adf.uk for Lois, uh, defendingfeminism.com for KS. And just in that last segment, KS saying, well, the reason we don't disrespect uh, a corpse um, uh, is perhaps the same reason we don't disrespect the body of someone who is perhaps in a permanent vegetative state. Um, it's more about sort of what that says about us, I suppose, rather than the, the corpse or the body of the, the, the individual in question, uh, if we were to, to go about doing that. Um, and it's interesting because there have been, you know, actual cases where, you know, involving um, either uh, aborted fetuses or miscarriages where there was an outcry when, for instance, it was revealed that a hospital in the UK at one time had been using that as sort of just matter to kind of fuel the furnace in the, the hospital boiler. And there were a lot of people who were outraged at that because that seems wrong to, to treat, you know, to treat these dead bodies of, of babies effectively as, as fuel. Um, uh, but that's KS's view, I assume on that, Lois, would be, well, it's not about the bodies, it's about the sort of the, the fact that we 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 wouldn't treat living people like that, and so there's there, it's the, a reflection of the the living person that that person might have been or was that, that that's really at stake there. What what's your response to that that kind of view? Yeah, I think at the heart of that is, is why is it bad? I mean, we can say it's bad because it makes us feel bad about ourselves. It's bad because it's icky. But but these are slightly circular. We're kind of saying it's bad because it's bad, and we're bad people for doing it. But but why is it bad? Why should we have respect? For someone who who is or or in one case was a person, um, and so I think we have to like really consider this consciousness. You know, if we talked about, um, okay, as you mentioned, you know, sleeping people have um, desires um, or um, dreams or or intentions, um, which um, I suppose is is true. Um, but um, the fetus, although it maybe does not have a desire yet, it certainly has an interest. Um, it has an interest uh, in being born, um, and abortion would act against its interests. So I think there's something to be considered there. Um, and we want to just really dig into the, the why would it be, be wrong to limit somebody who is has a capacity for consciousness, which is true of a fetus. They do, even if, if we are to accept uh, that they are unconscious in the womb, if we are to accept that, um, they have a capacity to do that, to become conscious. So we are limiting that and taking that um, chance for life or a chance for, for consciousness 
a way of taking that life away. Um, and that to me is the same uh, as somebody further on in their lives. And, and we also, um, you know, not on a more sad note, when we're talking about dreams and desires, um, some people don't have a dream and desire for life in, in certain uh, states or, or of, of, of mental illness. Sometimes uh, people feel suicidal and they don't have a desire for life, but it's our instinct and, and our human intuition to, to support that person uh, and to help them to live and to support them to, to uh, regain their purpose and their, uh, their meaning in life. Um, so we don't base this on desire. We don't base this on dream. And I think generally speaking outside the one, we do not base it on consciousness. So there must be something deeper there uh, that unites us in saying that we don't dis we don't um, mistreat we uh, give rights and we give respect to to persons uh, and in that category of persons is, is all human beings no matter uh, what they're doing what they're saying what they're able to contribute yeah so a um, lot there so I'm going to try to do the last one first and then I'll, I'll circle back um, but um, I think you really brought up an interesting idea there with like kind of the idea of like a suicidal teenager right um, and, you know, obviously that person is like, I don't have any desire to live anymore. And what's the appropriate response to that? Well, you know, I would probably argue that the suicidal teenager is seriously confused about what he wants, right? I would just maybe make a comparison to, um, you know, a child who um, gets in a fight with his father and he says, I hate you, dad. I, I never want to see you again, right? And the father says, you might be feeling that way right now, but I know that you're simply confused. You know, they might not say you are confused, but they'll, they'll have an understanding that that does not reflect their actual or sort of real desires. And I think the same thing could be said about like a suicidal teenager where we're like, you know, you just broke up with your girlfriend, you know, you didn't get into the college you want and things seem really bad right now, but I know that you actually have that deep desire to live. I know that you you are simply confused about what you think you want. And so um, I would actually contrast that because I think you could pro like have a case where someone truly has no desire to live, right? Like maybe there's a, a Buddhist monk who has reached such a level of enlightenment that you can say that that monk no longer has any desire to live. And um, in that particular case, as you know, I would argue that you know you aren't harming that monk if he if you, you kill him. Now you might say it's still wrong to do so, but I would say that it's no longer a harm if someone has reached a state where they truly have no more desires like that. And so, um, yeah, I would probably say that you know our intuitions can be a little bit tricky there. Um, but I think a lot of these things can be sort of resolved if we think more deeply about the situations in which they arise. Lois? Yeah, I think like, we, we have to take obviously um, the problem of, of suicide and mental illness very seriously. And, and you've addressed kind of like one, one instance uh, of that, you know, with a teenager um, who's just broken up with a girlfriend. But we also have to like, take into account the entirety of, and the seriousness of, of mental illness and their uh, right and, and good desires to, to support those uh, to live instead of of die in that state. Um, I think that um, if we to to kind of I guess kind of run through this this consciousness argument. Um, if a child is un unconscious, um, I think the question is can is it still can they still be wronged? Is probably the fundamental question that we're doing. If someone's not aware of being wronged, is it still okay to wrong them? Again, let's take this outside the womb. So, so if if you chaos were or if I were to go in and to steal your inheritance, and you never knew about it, you never knew that you had missed out on a great pile of money, um, and I had it and I was enjoying it, but you didn't know. So, is what I was doing still wrong if, if you didn't know about it? And according to our law, according to our um, general social moral conviction, the answer is yes. I shouldn't have stolen your inheritance. That should be rightfully yours to enjoy, and I've taken it away. I've, I've been a wrong thing. Uh, and so we know that, that people can be wronged, even if they're not conscious of it at the time. And, and that puts quite um, a, a moral difficulty, a, a very strenuous moral difficulty on, on, on harming a child, let alone, let alone uh, ending their life in the womb. Um, so what we want to do is instead of doing that, instead of harming them, even if they're unconscious of it, protect that life, see how we can best support it and see how we can support the woman uh, carrying that child uh, to be able to flourish in her life as well. Yeah, so I guess I'll say again, um, you know, my argument doesn't really rely on this sort of idea that you have to be conscious in order to be a person. 
um, you know, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, people who are unconscious suddenly like lose that because I think it's pretty clear that they still have psychological continuity. You know, when you wake up, you're not like a completely new person who has no memory of your past life. Um, you're still connected to your past self. And so your desires and stuff are still there in some sense when you're asleep. And so I, I don't think that, um, you know, uh, that like suddenly it's okay to like harm conscious children, unconscious children, or, or even like, you know, you could probably say that even when you're just kind of staring off into space, you're not really thinking about any particular desire, but you still have them, right? You don't stop like loving your children. And so, um, you know. Is, isn't the example that the lowest you're trying to, to, to reach here that, that the act of aborting a baby that is, you know, let's argue pre-conscious, a, a, a kind of like stealing the inheritance um, without them knowing, it's, it's, it's robbing that child of the possibility of the consciousness that they would have had, 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 you know, um, someone not interfered and, and, and stopped the viability of that life yeah. any longer. And that, if it's true in, in the case she outlines, is it true in the case of the child who's, who's effectively has, has, that has been taken away from them, even if they never knew it, um, it's still wrong to do it in, in that sense. I'm more arguing that until that initial consciousness begins, there's no person to be harmed. So it's a little bit weird to think about, right? But it's a bit like if I asked, you know, like I'm saying abortion is more like, um, you know, using contraception on the day, you know, you might uh, normally conceive. Is that harming a potential child? I would argue no, because there's no child, there's no person there to be harmed. And so, um, you know, I think the dis difference between like taking away an inheritance from a child is that, you know, you're... Um, I, I, you're making that child's worse life worse than it otherwise would have been. But in the case of abortion or for that matter, contraception, I'm saying that there's simply no child there, no person there to be harmed. I'm rejecting that idea that, you know, the uh, fetus is by itself a person. Uh, obviously, Lo I, I do want to start to wrap this up. And I, I'm aware that Lois just has a different understanding of, of what you're dealing with at that point. Um, you, you are dealing as far as Lois is concerned with a with a person um sort of you know and and yes even if that person wasn't conscious i so last question uh, 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 and this comes out of the fact that you did mention peter singer interestingly uh, and his views on an animal ethics but the whole question of, of when a child gains sort of moral status and whether that's a, allied to the, the you know this this idea of personhood is of course tricky because as you said you you see it as happening to coincide with the point at which a child is born okay and you've said already well there might be other people who put it further back you know at a point where neurology is developing in the womb there are of course people singer included who have said well what if actually it's the other direction what if actually it's after birth that really consciousness is really established you know um what if it's you know there's a period of up to 28 days let's say when a child isn't really a person there are some who've gone even further a year or more um and at that point, you're saying, well, it's legit. It would be legitimate potentially to, to to kill a child if they were, you know, certainly disabled or, or in pain or something. But even you know, because they were not, they they were, uh, you know, an encumbrance on a person's life or something like that. So, is that a problem? Is that a problem if people kind of go in the other direction and say, actually, I think the the personhood thing is 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 after birth. Actually, that that there could be a period when you don't think of a child that's outside the womb as as a person. Um. I mean, I don't think it's like a problem to make those arguments, but I, I think that those aren't going to be very compelling to people because, you know, I think like a three month old obviously has desires of some sort, um, is pretty clearly conscious, and um, it doesn't have that kind of maybe more advanced psychological capability that, um, you know, a one year old has probably develops, you know, that, you know like kind of self awareness, but there is psychological function there. And so, I also think there's a bit of a moral risk argument where, like, you know, I think uh, we should probably push that personhood back to where we see the first startings of consciousness, even if we think that it really, personhood really should arise a little bit later, simply because there's no real need to, you know, euthanize babies or whatever. Um, and there's no benefit to be gained from from taking that stance. Lois? Yeah, I think we're just on very shaky ground there with that argument when it comes to human rights law, because as soon as you start qualifying rights 
Um, you were saying that some people are, are less people than others. And, and as we know, historically, that has really uh, been something that has been very disadvantageous uh, to people who are in oppressed groups. And if we we're also saying that some people are, are worth more as persons because they're better able to contribute, they're better able to speak, they're better able to um, do whatever it is. And as soon as we go into that territory of, of gradients of persons, some people being more persons than others, um, that's when we start to see the disabled community um, having struggles up with, with having their rights upheld. Um, or even, you know, there's cases of, of, of you know, about women not having their rights upheld uh, because of being seen in a different state of, of class and then translating that to personhood. So I think as soon as we get into the territory of, of qualifying fundamental human rights, such as the right to life, um, especially in, in that last answer there, I, it becomes just very, very difficult to uphold human equality uh, for everyone. And that's what we know um, from experience is, is desperately important in society. Yeah. So I think that's kind of like the moral risk argument uh, again, right? Like if we make um, distinctions based on like psychological capabilities, um, then there's a risk it'll get misused. And I, I, like I said, um, I think there are two problems with that. One is that I think a biological standard is just as vulnerable to misuse. Um, you know, saying you have to have this type of DNA or something, you know, to be seen as a human. And if you don't have that, you're out of luck. That seems, you know, very vulnerable to, uh, to misuse. And um, I also think there's moral risk to uh, Lois's argument, even if you accept that you know, it's just, personhood is simply attached to being of a type human organism. You know, we do live in a world where, like, you know, animal life is widely disregarded. There's immense animal suffering. And we have to consider whether we are possibly doing, like, terrible things to, like, the natural world simply because we have the standard for personhood that just simply relies on being of um, a biological type homo sapiens. Yes, well, speciesism, as uh, as Singer puts it. But um, let let's start to wrap this up. Um, uh, so, perhaps a final thought from you, Lois. Final thought from you, Chaos, and and we'll 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 yeah we'll uh, we'll call a day on this one. Sure. Um, well, I think the the best case scenario that we can put forward um, as a society is not to say uh, that a woman's um, right to choice is is so up and beyond. Um, anything else that, that a, a baby's life is, is not important. It's equally not um, the, the best um, to say either uh, that a baby's life is paramount and, and a woman doesn't matter. I think what we can um, agree on is that um, there are uh, significant um, human rights concerns um, for um, women and for children uh, and impregnated and protected. So I think that um, the best scenario that we can face um, is to find solutions that protect both of those lives with both lives matter in a pregnancy. And uh, we've outlined and gone back and forth as much as possible um, on on the moral deaf person whose status uh, of a human being. Um, but I think that it's, it's vitally important to make sure that every single life of, of every human, no matter how vulnerable, no matter how small, no matter their age or stage or, or um, ability to, to think or, or to contribute, um, is absolutely valued. And it's the only way that we can really function on a basis of equality. And that's why... Uh, it's so important that both sides matter. Yeah. F final thoughts from you, Yeah. Kaz? So um, just going back to where we started, you know, I think that I think that the overturning of Roe versus Wade was disastrous in a material sense for American women, and we're going to fight hard to make sure our rights are restored. And I think that um, we really can bring a lot of these insights from philosophy into feminism to inform it and to make it stronger. And that's one of the things I'm hoping to do here. I think thinking about more thoughtfully about personhood and about bodily autonomy um, leads people generally to the conclusion that most, if not all, abortions are not immoral. It also leads to other benefits as well, such as more respect for the natural world, more respect for the animals we live with. And we can see a future in which, um, you know, we, we accept abortion while also accepting that, you know, other non-human animals are very important and that we shouldn't make decisions based on kind of arbitrary standards of what DNA type people have. Um, we'll leave it there. Thank you both for, for both arguing your perspectives uh, so uh, cogently. And uh, I, I will again just say if you want more from either of my guests today, uh, Lois 
uh, works for ADF.UK. That's their website, uh, defendingfeminism.com for KS. The links are with today's show. Um, and we would look forward to hearing your feedback as well, perhaps uh, in the comments uh, by getting in touch with the show, unbelievable at premier.org.uk. But for now, Lois and KS, thank you for being with me. Thank you. Thank you. For more conversations between Christians and skeptics, subscribe to the Unbelievable podcast. And for more updates and bonus content, sign up to the Unbelievable newsletter.